SBU is the Spina Bifida Association's new viral education program. Our goal is to bring the world's best care providers and resources directly into your home. SBU is the only free webinar series dedicated solely to the educational, employment, social, self-advocacy, and health needs of people with spina bifida. We hope that you will enjoy today's presentation, SOS, Save Our Skin and that you take time to complete the evaluation at the close of the presentation. Okay, I think we'll take this opportunity to get started. Um, my name is Jennifer Wilhelmy. It's a pleasure to be here from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota to talk about the important um, topic of skin um, and saving our skin. I'm a nurse practitioner who's also certified in um, wound care and management, and I come from adult spina bifida clinics in the country uh, housed at Gillette Lifetime Specialty Care Clinic. So we have a disciplinary spina bifida clinic um, and as a part of that it became very apparent uh, that wound care needed to be uh, part of that mix. So that is what I do uh, in that setting. We'll take questions at the end of the program. There is a one-page handout of the kind of keynote items. And then if you would like to have a copy of my slides, we certainly can uh, do that and arrange for that to be sent to you electronically at the end of the visit. So some of the objectives we want to look at today's visit is to increase knowledge um, related to skin conditions, not just pressure ulcers, but skin conditions that we frequently see in both children and adults with spina bifida. And then learn how those executive function issues might be a hindrance or a barrier to overcoming some of the skin uh, conditions and wound care, and then to develop some strategies for successful wound care. And some of that is just based on the learning that we have had within the clinic. Others based on some initial uh, studies and research that we started to complete uh, in this area. Basically, we all need to remember that the skin is the largest organ of our body. Sometimes we forget that because it's just so there. We think, oh, it's just my skin. I can, you know, uh, cut it. I can scrape it it'll heal, things will be fine, and we forget just how important this organ is. In an adult, uh, it accounts for about 22 pounds of us uh, comes from our skin. And what it does for us is very important. It protects us from infection, uh, most importantly. It regulates our body temperature, um, which is very important. It synthesizes that vitamin D that we get from the sun. And if you were in the last uh, presentation um, about adult medical issues and how to establish care in adult medicine, they talked about vitamin D deficiency and how that is more and more apparent in today's society. Uh, it's our sense of touch. And then it helps us to rid the body of waste products and salt, which is also a very important uh, objective. It's a big deal because our experience shows us that children and adults with spina bifida are at increased risk for pressure wounds, increased risk for skin infections, for burns, and for amputations at much younger ages uh, than we ever expected when we started our research. Back in 2003, some of my initial inspiration came from a physical therapist that I worked for. Her name was Laura Garan, and she did a simple chart review where she went back and looked at 45 charts of patients that had been seen within our spina bifida clinic. 100% of those patients had decreased foot sensation, 69% a history of wounds, 100% had their first wound as a child. Now Gillette historically is a hospital and specialty care clinic for pediatrics. Um, and for a long time, the pediatric world considered itself kind of immune to pressure ulcers. Um, but we found that a lot of the ulcerated issues that are happening in skin are coming in in children as young as two years of age. Um, and so it really brought things to the forefront uh, when she started to look into those charts. Ten percent of the folks had six or more wounds, some with a history of intermittent open wounds for five, six, seven years in a row um, without receiving any type of uh, closure to that area, putting them at high risk for infection. Then in 2009, before the Spina Bifida Conference last year, I started a study 
uh, with a seeding technologist that works in my area. And I'm fortunate that in my clinic, we always have an orthotist and a prosthetist and a seeding technologist that's a part of the clinic. So when I see a patient in clinic that has a wound, uh, those services are immediately available to them, and that person actually can meet with me and the patient side by side to look at the wound and then look at the possible causes and then do an adjustment to that particular piece of equipment to prevent the wound from progressing. And this can be very beneficial. As some of you know, sometimes in the community it can take weeks to coordinate visits in between these providers. And so we decided to go back and look at our charts to find out when we were both involved in the care of an individual with spina bifida or cerebral palsy. Um, what types of wounds were we seeing and was there a difference made in the type of care and the closure of the wounds based on that collaboration? So we're just in our first full year of data collection because it's a retrospective review trying to identify folks that had seating surface ulcers. So pressure ulcers that happened when they were sitting in their wheelchair as a result of some type of pressure um, on that uh, area of skin. Our cerebral palsy patients, there were 18 of them so far, they came to the clinic and, I, and were identified for their first visit when they had stage one and two ulcers. And we'll talk about that. That's a very low grade, very superficial, minimal ulceration of the skin. Our spina, bif spina bifida patients, of which we had 13 so far, they did not present to the clinic for treatment until they had stage three and four ulcers. These are full thickness wounds, and a full thickness wound can take um, anywhere from three months to a year to heal and very often requires surgical intervention to do so. So they were much more serious wounds and it really heightened our awareness and attention uh, of the difficulties of pressure ulcers in individuals with spina bifida and how much more severe they get before intervention is sought. Um, the reasons that we thought there was a possibility of more severe or advanced ulcers on initial visit than their peers with cerebral palsy were mostly twofold. One was that the area was insensate where the ulcer was occurring. So that pressure could have been on that area for many days without that individual realizing it causing more significant damage than for a person with cerebral palsy. They generally have full sensation and so just minor pain responses maybe on the buttocks area would cause them to seek further treatment and to look at what might be going on in that area. The second was our hunch that some of the challenges that go along with executive function cause an individual that has spina bifida to have difficulty initiating a plan to deal with an unexpected health situation such as a pressure ulcer. So therefore, they're unable to initiate the plan that goes along with early intervention in the treatment of a wound um, and how to get medical attention to that area, how to follow through with the complex um, issues of wound care and how to seek support in their natural setting to accommodate for that. The skin concerns that we want to speak about today um, are pressure ulcers, burns, and incontinent dermatitis. These are three things that we commonly see uh, coming into the clinic um, and things that we believe could be um, prevented with better skin care and hygiene. A pressure ulcer, as most of you are very familiar with, uh, is an area of skin that breaks down when you stay in one position too long without shifting your weight. So damage to the skin happens as the blood supply is squeezed out of the tissue based on the pressure, um, causing that tissue to die, and that's sometimes called ischemia or necrosis of the tissue when it dies as it's squeezed together. The damage gets worse until that pressure is removed um, and the wound is treated. And so you can see how um, important it is uh, to do those daily skin checks. And we'll talk about that over and over, and we heard it many times as well in this adult class that was just before this session, where finding those areas that are red early can help us kind of key in to removing the pressure and preventing further damage from occurring. And so those daily skin checks with a mirror are going to be essential um, starting very young um, for the children with spina bifida. One of the things that has been shown in parts of the literature is that a lot of attention is paid to a lot of the aspects of spina bifida, such as shunting, hydrocephalus, 
um, tethered cord. And based on those great um, medical um, achievements, some of the focus on some of the basic cares, such as skin care, has kind of been put off to the side. And so when kids were asked to draw self-portraits of themselves, uh, and those kids were not able to feel below the level of their lesion, many times they would not draw the body parts that they didn't feel. They had a disassociation with all of the areas of their body that they were not sensate in, which means they didn't pay particular attention to those areas on a daily basis. So our hospital went through an entire rethinking of how we address skin care uh, in pediatrics and created some tools for parents to play with their children starting in infancy where they're recognizing their feet, they're finding stickers on their feet and their lower extremities so that it becomes a part of them and a part that they're constantly checking for changes in areas uh, of decreased sensation. This is uh, what a stage one pressure ulcer typically will look like. This is an elbow. Um, and on that elbow would be a patch of redness. If you pushed in the center of the redness, it would not turn white. It's called non-blanchable redness, so that redness stays in place. Um, and if you noticed an area of, like, of this on your skin or on the skin of a loved one that you were caring for and it lasted greater than approximately 20 minutes, you would want to seek attention to look at what pressure might be causing that and remove that pressure so that the skin could heal and regenerate. These uh, ulcers are not open. The skin itself is closed. Uh, it's, it's just a color change uh, of non-blanchable redness to the surface. It might feel warm. It might feel squishy when you touch it. Um, but it's indicating that the skin has suffered that superficial injury uh, that comes from having pressure uh, over a bony prominence. This is a stage two pressure ulcer, and this is a pair of butt cheeks. It's kind of a narrowed in view of a pair of butt cheeks. Um, you can see that they're generally round in nature. Most pressure ulcers are round. I've only had a couple of exceptions to that, and that's generally when someone has chosen to sit on something other than their cushion. They will often get a pressure ulcer that mirrors the image of their keys. Uh, I had a young boy who was inpatient for quite a while and got a little bored. He put some Tic Tacs between himself and his TLSO, his spinal orthoses, so he had two Tic Tac pressure ulcers. Uh, he wanted to do a science experiment to see what would happen if, if uh, Tic Tacs were left up against the skin. He was looking more for color changes and cool stuff like that. They did, in fact, turn white um, instead of green, but he also caused two little tic-tac-sized pressure ulcers on his skin from the pressure between the skin and the brace and that causing that. Now he couldn't feel that area so it didn't seem like a big deal to him that the skin had been damaged but it could have opened him up for greater infection especially as we know in our highly contagious hospital settings where lots of bugs are running around. So um, this is a stage two pressure ulcer. It's very superficial. It's just that first layer of skin. It reminds me similarly of when you first ran out in the spring uh, and skinned your knee. You kind of took off that first layer of skin. That's what happens in a stage two pressure ulcer. Um, and these, uh, this is considered partial thickness. So you haven't gone into those deeper layers of skin, just kind of taken off the surface. The pictures do get worse, unfortunately. Um, this is a stage three ulcer, kind of in the sacral area, right at the top of the coccyx, um, above there. That is a stage three. And now you're getting some depth to the ulcer. So uh, these are called full thickness uh, ulcers because we've now gone through the first layer of skin into the subcutaneous fat. And there have been situations where we can actually see that fat in clinic depending on the area where the pressure ulcer is. Um, but these become much more serious. The average stage three uh, and above pressure ulcer um, costs an average of $70,000 to treat uh, to healing point. And that's without significant um, and repeated surgical interventions. So you can imagine that they're very, very expensive to treat. And if it's going to take a month to heal, it's probably going to take a year to heal unless you go through a flat procedure um, where it's surgically closed. So they're very slow in healing and they really take people out in their normal day-to-day -day, uh, function. 
Along that comes our stage four ulcers. And this can be a little graphic to look at, but it's been the most common ulcer that we've seen coming into our clinic over the last three months. They've been left ischial tuberosity ulcers. So the ischial tuberosity is that sitting bone that is right under when you lift up your leg, you can feel that bone under there. That's called the ischial tuberosity. And that ulcer uh, has occurred repeatedly uh, in individuals with spina bifida. And we're not quite sure why. Is it, it's the folks coming in to have all different kinds of seats, all different kinds of backgrounds. Their ages span from 17 to 40, so there was no specific uh, age group, both male and female. Um, but because it's probably an area that A, they can't feel, and B, they can't see, it's often hard to monitor the status of the skin in that area. And so that's why visiting your local dollar store for a handheld mirror that you can use to kind of shine to the back and each side to look to see how the skin integrity is back there is going to be so essential. Uh, the 17 year old that I currently uh, follow for this um, used to have a mirror in a location of his house where he would check every time he got out of the bathroom. One day mom moved the mirror, not on purpose, but so that someone else could use it within the house and it never returned to its original spot. And unfortunately this individual wasn't able to problem solve to get the mirror back or to tell mom, hey, I was using that to look at my skin. Um, instead he just said, well, the mirror's not there so I won't look anymore. Um, and then over time noticed some drainage on his sheets, some drainage on his cushion, uh, presented to clinic with a stage four pressure ulcer, uh, looking very similar to this and still in the healing process. Um, most often the stage four ulcers need to go to surgery because um, we have now communication between the outside world and the bone because stage four ulcers involve muscle, bone, and tendon. Uh, and when those bones are, are exposed to air and the, the, all the bugs that like to grow, especially in the buttocks area, um, they need to be taken to surgery to scrape the bone to clean it um, and prevent uh, further uh, osteomyelitis, which is bone infection. So it can be a very um, significant uh, problem to deal with. Within the last five to seven years, uh, two more categories of pressure ulcers were added. One is the unstageable decubitus ulcer. So this is an ulcer, uh, this is again a sacral area, so that lower back area, um, where it appears to have a nice scab over it. And it looks fairly pleasant because you think, well, it's got a scab over it. My mom always told me never pick a scab. You know, just leave it alone. The natural healing process will take place. And that's not necessarily true for pressure ulcers because we know that underneath this is at least a stage three, if not a stage four pressure ulcer, and that that won't heal unless that SCAR, that hard covering that's on the outside is removed, the tissue is cleaned underneath, and then proper wound management is um, initiated at that time. So until we can actually see the base of the ulcer, we don't guess, we just call it unstageable, and then we take the actions, whether they be in the outpatient setting or in uh, the inpatient setting in the operating room, to debride the area, remove this hard leathery cover uh, to determine what's going on underneath the uh, surface. It's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. We're just seeing the tip of what's going on underneath. And then deep tissue injury, which you can see circled, which looks similar to dark purple bruising, but would happen over an area that's received too much pressure. Now, sometimes we're fortunate, and these do not open. Uh, they look like purple deep bruising. We remove the pressure. Gradually, the skin regains its circulation, healing the area, and then the patient is able to move forward um, with their life. But sometimes they do open, and then we need to treat the ulcer as it presents. Um, generally with uh, more of a stage three or four uh, presentation than we would see um, without a deep tissue injury. <clears throat> Preventing pressure ulcers uh, can go a long way, but it's really a difficult and complicated um, issue. I struggled a lot preparing for this session in what type of handouts to give. Do I give all the slides? Do I give none of the slides? And what I settled on was the bright red piece of paper that you have that gives you just those key things that I want you to take home, uh, both to use in your own life or to use and help someone in 
um, your life that you're caring for that has spina bifida because it's just so essential that we get to some of these basic um, prevention strategies. And number one in that is keeping the skin as clean and as dry as possible. Uh, trying to eliminate and reduce as much moisture as possible and protecting that skin from injury. I often have patients that come to clinic maybe with a butt wound, but as they transfer between the clinic table and their wheelchair, they're banging their legs that they don't feel on the exam table, on their chair, and creating other pressure situations. So it's paying attention to all of the skin, not just the skin that's of great uh, issue at the time. Then not massaging over bony prominences that become red. We simply want to remove any pressure, so if it's from a brace, remove that pressure, allow that skin to heal, see your local orthotist to have adjustments made in the area where the redness occurred. And then there used to be a great um, kind of grandmother's uh, solution to pressure ulcers, and that was to put everybody on a donut, one of those blow-up donuts, uh, to let their butts heal. And what they found is that the donut actually restricted the amount of blood flow to the wound and caused further uh, necrosis or death. So we don't advise using any kind of donut or ring pressure relieving devices because if you think about yourself, when I sit in an inner tube, my whole butt falls through and gets kind of constricted and there's no blood flow going to there. So we want to make sure that we get as much blood nutrients to that area as possible. And then some of the harder things to remember are the repositioning. A lot of the adults that come to my clinic, they may work in jobs, they might have volunteer, they might be active in sports, and to ask them to get out of their chair every two hours for 15 to 30 minutes um, is something that they're not able to accommodate that request. And so I gave you some ideas in that handout. Um, one of our, our favorite seating persons likes to tell her uh, patients to take a nap in their lap, and that's where they kind of can fold frontwards, placing your... Um, elbows and shoulders into your lap so that it pulls up the butt bones off the wheelchair cushion. If you can do that for a few minutes, it can help relieve any pressure that's happening over those IT bones. Um, also, wheelchair push-ups have been talked about. It's difficult to maintain a position long enough to let the blood supply go. I mean, you'd almost have to push up and then, like, stay there. Okay, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, letting the blood flow back in versus just a quick uh, push-up in your chair, but anything you can do to shift side to side um, to do the wheelchair push-ups, uh, anytime you think of it, if you're a TV watcher, every time a commercial comes on TV to do a couple of those wheelchair push-ups or to shift from side to side. Those of us that don't have spina bifida uh, and have full sensation in our lower extremities, we get natural cues from our body to shift. If you watch, like I'm watching all of you right now, um, sit at a presentation, people will start fidgeting, they'll start shifting from side to side. Sometimes that's just to keep themselves awake, and I don't mind if that's the reason, because I am the last speaker of the day, and that's always a hard uh, shift to follow. Um, but other times it's their body telling them there's too much pressure on this side of your butt, move to the other side, or this hip is a little bit sore, shift over. And our body sends us those nonverbal signals to do that. And so, with an individual with spina bifida and lower extremity insensation below the level of that lesion, we need to teach ourselves ways to remember to do that. Now, most uh, young adults and teens with spina bifida also have cell phones, uh, eye touches, iPads, um, you name it, they've got more technology and know how to use it a lot better than I do. And with that comes a lot of different alarms that you can set. So you could set different music or different alarms to go off every hour or two to remind yourself to shift positions, get some new blood supply going, and to protect that skin. These simple things can save you from months of, uh, sometimes folks end up on bed rest. We try to avoid that at all costs, but you can imagine how much your social life would be decreased if you found yourself having to stay out of your wheelchair to heal an ulcer. Um, the other thing is never sitting on personal items. It's very tempting to use your wheelchair uh, and the cushion to tuck things in to keep phones, keys. I had someone come to clinic once sitting on a decorative knife. Uh, it was about this long. He thought it was cool. He would show it off. Uh, not really the time in society to be carrying a decorative knife around to show off, but uh, he thought it was really cool. And so sitting on that between him and his cushion uh, is a recipe for disaster as far as ending up with an ulcer that looks like the shape of a decorative knife. So we want to make sure that we um, 
just sit on our cushions. And we use other devices such as bags to the side or um, to the rear uh, to hold our personal items for us. And then transferring our cushion to other seating surfaces. Um, I always have at least one person a summer that comes in new to the clinic that's gone on a long road trip, whether that be by train, plane, or automobile. And they're now sitting on a surface other than their wheelchair cushion that doesn't have good pressure management. And so if your cushion is available to do that, I encourage people to take the cushion from the chair to the car seat, to the plane seat, to the um, train, any of those things to avoid any type of pressure skin breakdown from long trips. Um, I also had another individual who wanted to be as um, close to his peers as possible in a school setting. And you can imagine in most high schools they have those hard wooden chairs on all the desks. So he would transfer from his supportive skin saving cushion to a desk where he could sit with his peers, which is great. But the skin did not tolerate the hard wooden chair. Um, and so he ended up with an ulcer from sitting on the school chairs. Um, just trying to be a normal teenager. And so sometimes you might have to just transfer your cushion to that surface so that you have a safe surface for your skin. And then above all else, if you can just look, if you can look once a day, that would be awesome. If you can look twice a day, even better. Morning and evening when you brush your teeth, just take a peek using a handheld mirror or a partner. Some people will get in and start using a partner to do skin checks just to look for any areas of redness or the start of any kind of an ulceration so that you can take action early and be that stage one person that comes in uh, for attention versus stage four when we're already into uh, lots of trouble. Treatment is fairly individualized to the wound. Um, we encourage people to seek some type of medical attention when redness doesn't go away in 15 to 30 minutes after the pressure is removed. This may be as simple as seeing your orthotist, your seating specialist, your vendor to have adjustments made to the equipment that we're using. At Gillette, we really are in the, in the business of causing stage one ulcers because of all the equipment that people are fitted with to support them for better function, but we also have to be in the business of modifying and troubleshooting and preventing stage one ulcers from getting to be two, three, four, uh, and beyond. The wound dressing is individualized uh, to each ulcer. There are thousands and thousands of wound products, and every rep will tell you that theirs is the best, it heals the fastest, it works the best. Um, they're very expensive as well, and your local insurance guidelines and reimbursement changes uh, based on what they've put into their formulary. So it's hard to tout one over the other. You really have to look at the wound and follow these simple goals, which is A, remove the pressure. Any fancy dressing will not do its job. No surgery will do its job if the pressure remains there. Um, you need to manage the drainage. Uh, create a moist wound healing environment, uh, which is a change for some folks. They used to think, you know, put the buns up to sun, get them dried out, get the wound dried out, but uh, studies have shown that wounds like to be moist uh, in their healing stages. And then monitor for any signs or symptoms of infection. Burns is the next issue. Um, at Gillette Lifetime, we don't do a lot of treatment of burns, but we've heard and collected stories um, from patients with spina bifida and their difficulties in the realm of burns. Here it describes for you uh, first, second, and third degree burns um, as it goes from uh, less serious on the first degree to very serious on the third degree. Um, and what we really speak about is burn prevention, um, especially in bathing, because this seems to be such a big issue, depending on if you're not used to the water temperatures within the, the new hotel that you go to or the friend's house uh, or even your own home, to make sure you're checking the water before you get into a shower or bathtub is just essential, because we've had a lot of burns happen in feet and lower extremities. If you're not able to feel the water's too hot, you wouldn't be able to have that a mechanism to have you withdraw yourself from the water. Checking surfaces for hot spots before sitting on them. Um, lots of stories of kids that have been burned on playground slides, uh, sitting on curbs for parades because the curbs have gotten very hot. 
That was uh, huge in Disney last year. If you ever tried to sit on any of the ground for some of their parades, the blacktop became very, very hot. And if you didn't have the sensation to be able to withdraw yourself from that, it uh, could cause burns. Um, never placing hot items uh, such as food or drinks into your lap without a lap board. Our occupational therapists work with folks to design uh, protective lap covers because we know that your laps become your trays, become your transport of food from the microwave to the table uh, and so forth. So we want to make sure that we create situations that are safe so that burns don't occur in lap settings. And then wearing sunscreen, especially on the tops of feet. And I didn't have an appreciation for this, you know, even growing up and being a mom, you always seem to start with sunscreen from the top and you paid attention to the face and the shoulders. But if you're sitting in a wheelchair, the tops of your feet sometimes are sticking out very prominently and be can become very burned and blistered. I had a young gal who was probably about 15 who went to a campfire um, and thought it was very harmless. She had the campfire, they had a lot of fun. The next morning she woke up after camping uh, and found that her pants were stuck to her legs. Um, and she had sat just a little too close to the campfire and didn't realize it because she lacked sensation in her calves to be able to sense that she was just a little too close. Um, and so that kind of burn and blistering process had started by the time she realized and went to change her clothes the next morning. So it's important just to talk about those things because they're not things that we would normally think about. And we forget about how much that sensation of pain and the sensation of feeling protects us from things in day-to-day -day life that we forget to tell our kids, uh, young adults and teens, um, as well as older adults to avoid when they lack sensation in those areas. Um, checking car seats, buckles, footrests, and other things that could be worn by the sun are especially important uh, in warmer climates. And we've had some warm weather here over the last few days, and things can become quite warm um, and dangerous. Burn treatment really depends on the degree of the burn. Uh, we recommend for all burns that you seek medical attention immediately, but the goals generally are early intervention and treatment to prevent infection. Um, the biggest complication of burns is infection, uh, so we want to make sure that people are being treated uh, accordingly. Incontinence dermatitis is the last of the three things that we want to discuss that happen uh, with skin care. And this is a chemical irritation that happens uh, and damage to the skin in the presence of urine or feces on the skin surface. It can present as blisters, redness, warmth. I'll often get inpatient consults for what people will call pressure, but once you've gotten there, it turns out to be more of a picture of incontinence dermatitis. It carries the increased risk of infection, especially yeast um, infection. And what the moisture does is it break down, breaks down the skin's ability to handle pressure. So they kind of go hand in hand. As the skin becomes saturated in urine, it expands, the cells expand, and then when pressure is presented on top of that, someone is at increased risk of a pressure ulcer developing in light of the incontinence dermatitis. It also increases personal odor, and as we know, that that can impact social relationships, job placements, um, looking at you know activities, outings, your thoughts and feelings about yourself, all are impacted by increased personal odor. So keeping a handle on incontinence dermatitis can be very uh, beneficial in many areas. This is what that looks like. This is a very severe case, but you can see it's almost like a sunburning of the bottom. Um, but it's a chemical reaction to the urine that's occurring in that area. Um, and so it's important that we act quickly when accidents occur or if wetness occurs to prevent that from uh, progressing to a stage like this that is so painful. How can we prevent uh, incontinence dermatitis? Well, the first thing is to try to eliminate as much as possible or decrease the skin's exposure to urine or feces. Um, sometimes that's using a barrier ointment. Uh, there's a lot of them on the market. I don't tout one over the other. Another, I know Calmaceptine is here. Um, Lantiseptic is very popular. Most of the uh, product companies, Hollister, Coloplast, those have some type of skin barrier product. But after cleansing with a pH balanced uh, soap that's made for the buttocks and personal care areas, you would apply this thin layer of barrier to that skin so that it forms like a shield 
to keep out the urine and the feces. And this would be done each time you have an episode of incontinence. So it would be kind of a skin cleaning, hygiene uh, routine that you would get involved in. And usually the products um, pay for themselves as far as the prevention that they afford you and not having to deal with a painful uh, but such as that. You can also buy like Desitin Clear, which is over the counter, which can be used, Aqua for some of those similar things over the counter that can be used just as beneficially to create a barrier so your skin doesn't become waterlogged and damaged chemically from the urine. And then to help create a daily schedule of alarms if you're likely to forget checking for wetness. And this can be a, this can be a, a real problem for individuals um, that may have some uh, executive function issues is that they just simply forget it's part of the routine to be changing that um, incontinent product every three to four hours or more often for significant um, accidents. So we want to make sure that we help them to create a daily schedule uh, to keep them as dry as possible. And then looking at all other options uh, that go along with urological care um, and bowel management um, to try to maintain the best environment in that area possible. The treatment, again, is somewhat individualized. You have to be able to look at the skin in that area and be able to identify what the causes are and what the treatments. Often we need to use an antifungal if there's yeast involved. Um, we need to use the barrier product to keep out further urine and feces damage, and then we try to eliminate as much uh, wetness as possible. So this may be, um, in extreme cases, a Foley catheter might be placed in the short, short term to be able to heal up the skin if we can't manage the wetness. For men, it's a little easier because they could switch to more of a condom catheterization system so that they could divert the wetness um, off of the skin to be able to manage the rash and be able to heal that skin. And then moving forward, looking at uh, better ways of eliminating wetness. Some of the barriers that we found um, to good skin uh, care come back to some of the things we previously talked about, one of which is um, areas that have no feeling often get us to give them less attention. And so that's why we want to be speaking as much as we can to as many groups as we can to draw attention to the fact that these areas need just as much attention as all the other areas, as our shunt, as our bladder, um, as uh, anything else, our tethered cord, we need to be paying attention to our skin. And then looking at uh, some of the in executive function challenges, we've had some good speakers talking about impulse control, about lack of initiation, the ability to start a plan, follow through with the plan. So in clinic, we try to enable folks as much as possible to be able to have the tools necessary to succeed uh, in taking care of their skin. And often that will be a step-by-step -step plan that they leave with. So what I'll do is um, we're not as tech-savvy uh, as I'd like us to be, so I'll create a Word document that says step-by-step -step what our skin plan is. And then I'll take that in with the patient. We'll go over it together step-by-step, -step, do some role-playing, and be able to do some demons return demonstration. But if we look at where some of the most common areas are where these are occurring, generally the wound care and some of the care of the incontinence dermatitis and the burns cannot be left simply to the individual with spina bifida. They're often in areas that are hard to reach and hard to see, so that enables us to, have, to enlist a nurse, a caregiver, um, a parent, someone that can be on the team with us to help perform those daily needs in either wound care or management that need to occur. So although we all want to be as independent as possible, sometimes it will take my patients several visits to realize that they might need to add one more person to the team that can actually reach that area. Because I, I don't have spina bifida, but I still would not be able to dress my own butt wound even as a wound nurse because I'm not able to see that. And you know how when you look in a mirror and you try to match what you're doing in the mirror with what you're doing to yourself, you're like going in two different directions. And so we want to make sure that we get the right team members on board. I did have a gal who was coming in and she came in weekly for a few weeks and each week she came with a new ulcer. 
Um, and we just couldn't quite figure. She lived in more of a supported living setting, but her goal was to be as independent as possible. I want to do this myself, my way. Um, but unfortunately, each time she came, most of the items on the list had not been completed because she had simply either forgot to do them, she had meant to get around to doing them, and then another ulcer would pop up. And so by simply en enlisting more of a care coordinator uh, person in her life to get some of those tasks around what needed to occur for wound care all set up so that she could have some support um, and feel independent but in control, we were able to quickly heal all of the ulcers and have the last and most major one almost done. And so we did take a few visits to kind of let her do things herself because it took those couple of visits for her to realize that I need to be part of a team to get my skin under control and to treat this and that uh, it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to take help if it's going to benefit me in the long run and uh, get me back into my life the way that I want to be there. Um, other things is access to uh, early care intervention can sometimes be difficult. I know folks will call their local provider, their local seating specialist, and the next appointment is in four to six weeks. A lot can happen to that wound in four to six weeks, so we realize that access is really uh, an issue and are working hard, at least in our area, to make sure that folks that call on the phone and identify a wound are seen within 24 hours by somebody who can lay eyes on that and try to direct care in all the areas that it needs to occur. And then our lack of early teaching and focus on skin care. Getting back to those babies, toddlers, uh, young children and in, in making it part of their routine that skin is just as important as every other aspect of your body. Just like taking vitamins, just like brushing your teeth, you got to look at your skin and you got to take action if something isn't right. The case study that I brought for you today is um, one of my favorite patients, 52 year old female. She had spina bifida, lumbar myelomeningocele. Um, she was insensate below the bottom of her rib cage and she had a power wheelchair, custom seating. Um, some of her underlying health issues was she had some chronic renal failure and was on dialysis. And she had experienced about a 20 pound weight loss uh, over six months. And her favorite way to have staff that worked with her reposition her was the major wedgie way. She liked them to come up behind her, grab onto all the layers behind her, and then just pull her back into her spot. And so over time, um, that shearing forces across her seat and the fact that she wasn't sitting well and throughout the day would slide based on her weight loss, she developed a stage um, three left IT ulcer. And this is what it looked like at initial visit. It doesn't look so overwhelming when you're looking at it in two dimensional, but my whole finger could fit inside. So when you put your finger in, it could go all the way up uh, and inside there um, when she came to her initial visit. So one of the first things we did, of course, was look at her seat. Um, because we're blessed to have the seating person right in there with us, uh, they could bring in the pressure mapping. And if anybody hasn't seen pressure mapping, it's a little mat that sits over your seat. Then you sit in the seat. And you can see uh, on that picture where that red hot area is in red, that's right where her ulcer was. So the foam and the fit of her seat had changed with her weight loss and some of her health issues to develop this high level of pressure occurring over that left ischial tuberosity. And so as the day went on and the seating professional worked on her seat, you can see that they cleared it up more and more to that bottom corner where it's all blue, it looks fabulous, uh, and she is doing much better from a pressure uh, setting. So now with this stage three ulcer, we did not take her out of her seat, put her on bed rest. We fixed her seat, we made sure it was safe, and we let her stay in it because it's actually the safest place for her to be. If we take her out of her chair and put her into bed, put her into a recliner, put her into something that's not pressure mapped for her, we're going to have wounds in other places. So the safest thing is to make sure the seat's safe and then keep them in the seat. So about six weeks from initial visit, you can see that we've granulated the tissue all the way to the surface. And so it's just closing it side to side that now we have to do. Um, very simple interventions. We did not use expensive dressings. We did not use any high-tech therapy. We simply removed the pressure, controlled the drainage, maximized the wound healing on the wound bed, and she began to heal. And six weeks from her initial visit um, was well on her way. Now, this is an ulcer that probably took 
uh, five months to heal total. And that's pretty typical for a stage three uh, that it would take that long. So over and over again we talk about how does uh, executive function relate to skin health. And what we found in the clinic setting is that uh, most of the individuals coming into the clinic don't have a plan. There's no plan on how they want to take care of their skin. They've got a plan most of the time. If my shunt fails, this is what I'm going to do. If I have a urinary tract infection, these are the things that happen. This is what I'm going to do. But we help them to develop a skin safety plan. What am I going to do for my skin? And then they have difficulty understanding the sequence of events that happen in response to how the wound occurs, uh, how to take care of that skin, and how to anticipate problems and what I'll do with problems. So when I do the plan that I was talking about, I first list my concern at the top, then I list the steps to caring for it, and then after that I, look, I list what could go wrong. So these are the things you might see, and this means things are going wrong and you need to call us and how to, to do that. So that everybody leaves with a written thing in their hand. Now, you always have to worry about that person that doesn't read, because across um, the country there are individuals with all different types of issues that do or don't read. Um, and so often I'll have that person start by kind of reading it with me um, and reading it back to me so that I can test that. But we've had to be more creative in some situations. You might have to audio record that uh, for them to take so that they can listen to it. Um, we do have a video camera available in clinic too, so we could make one of those small little CDs of the cares if there's somebody that learns more visually, um, we'd be able to do it that way. So you really have to be able to take the time uh, to look at your um, patient and be able to determine what's the best way that we can ensure success um, in anticipating keeping the skin safe and treating any issues that might occur. And then uh, having that skin action plan, if the problem is noted, seeking medical attention. And then if you're outside of a clinic that's not used to working with individuals that have um, executive function, making sure that you request the provider give you a step-by-step -step plan. You know, most of the time, if anything we request within clinic, if we're outside of Gillette or uh, another specialty clinic, they'll usually honor that request. They're just not used to doing that for all their patients. So I usually instruct people to make sure that they have written uh, instructions before they leave so that they can remember uh, what they need to do. And then to think of what ifs um, and bring those to clinic, write them down, like what if this happens? What if my wound turns black? What if my wound turns red? What if I don't feel good? What are the things that I'm going to do when those happen? So we can talk about those ahead of time versus when they happen and you can't necessarily think uh, clearly in those type of settings. And then tools for success. Mirrors are the biggest tool you can give. I think I'm going to go for some kind of grant so next year I can come with a bunch of handheld mirrors or I'll just raid every dollar store in St. Paul and uh, Minneapolis. But they might be tricky to get on the plane. We'll have to see. But mirrors are the key. Everybody needs to have access to a mirror that they can hold that's large enough that they can see their butt and their back. Um, or they need to have a partner to do skin checks with. Um, we need to check skin every morning and hopefully every evening so that we can look for those minor changes, the minor redness, the minor warmth that's occurring, and take action to remove the pressure at that point, or to look for those areas of dermatitis that are just starting to get red based on too much urine or feces exposure. And then we need to communicate with our healthcare providers about how we learn and process information the best. Be those ambassadors, those educators of others, um, and let them know, do you do better by looking at written words? Do you do better at pictures? Are you more of a verbal person? So everything you take in is very verbal, um, so that they can provide you with information that meets your needs. And then some of the tools available on our website um, at www.gillettechildrens.com. Um, we have a DVD of foot care for adults, one that's also made for kids. Um, I believe you can have access to the education program. There's a one foot, two foot, red foot, blue foot, which is a pediatric um, education uh, setting on teaching kids to play more with their lower extremities, to identify them as parts of their body. Um, pedicure cards that are available that you can take with if you're going uh, to get a pedicure somewhere, you know, cutting toenails straight across, 
preventing ingrown nails, preventing any damage to the surface of the feet that could result in wounds, and then bathtub thermometer cards um, that can help you check the temperature before you get in to prevent those burns from occurring. And then, of course, you can get in touch with us as well as see other educational tools that we have available that are um, to be printed out uh, on that website. Gillette's very good about usually the only charge that comes with it is like how to get it to you, uh, and sometimes we even have that covered. Um, any questions, feel free to give me a call um, or to uh, email me. The email is jwilhelmy um, at gillettechildrens.com. I think you can also search it out when you're on the website uh, for different folks, but it's pretty easy to get to. Um, some of our references, and then this uh, means it's the end. We'll take questions. Um, and comes out of a SeaWorld uh, presentation that I went to last year while I was at the uh, Orlando Spina Bifida. So uh, any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. I'll be repeating them as well so everybody can hear. Hi, back here. Okay. This is actually more of a comment. Uh, after much, much, much trial and error, Buto's Bud Paste is by far the best that I've found for healing pressure ulcers. Okay. And you just want to make sure that you're using it uh, on a situation where it would be more of a superficial ulcer. You know, so we're talking about like uh, stage one and two ulcers or that incontinent dermatitis. Um, if you have a deeper uh, crater-like ulcer, you know, of course, the butt paste may be more of a hindrance. But we do have fairly good luck preventing the incontinence dermatitis with the butt paste as well. Right. Okay. I have really, really good luck uh, preventing the stage threes and fours with the butt paste, you know, keeping mm -hmm. it at that superficial level. Right. Yep. And just trying to figure out what's, where's the pressure coming from. Be a little detective, get your magnifying glass out and try to figure out where that pressure is coming from and remove it. Vinegar soaks for the feet. And I think the reason that they're doing that is to get at that uh, bacteria and yeast that's growing between the toes. So that can be beneficial. Uh, soaking the feet uh, can be a very beneficial thing as long as you're drying well. Um, because we found uh, that individuals that don't dry well between the toes develop athlete's foot yeast fungal infections. I've also found good luck with people use, wearing braces, a product called Zeasorb, Z-E-A-S-O-R-B. It's a powder. Um, you massage it in between the toes and on the feet before you put the braces and the socks on. It helps wick away the moisture. How about anything particular to, to clean, like the AFOs or? Um... Just soap and water. Yeah, that's typically what we do to clean AFOs. Zeasorb, Z-E-A-S-O-R-B. And it comes as well in an antifungal versus a regular just kind of moisture wicking. It's available if you ask. If you don't see it on the shelf like at a Walgreens, usually if you ask the pharmacist, they'll order it in for you, but it's not prescription. Do you know who, who makes it? You know I'm not sure. If you it? Google it, that manufacturer okay. will come up. Okay. Thank it's you. It's the only product. But we've had really good luck with our brace wares, trying to maintain, like, foot odor and cracking and crevices and stuff. Thank you. Yep. One of the issues that my daughter has had with her, um, her feet uh, started out more looking like a, a blister. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather than a pressure issue is sure is still the same thing right if it's over um, a bony prominence like the top of a toe the underside of a toe um, blisters are considered stage two ulcers if they're over a bony prominence even if the skin's still intact but you can see the fluid underneath it a lot of pressure ulcers will start as blisters uh, especially over areas where braces and shoes are worn because that rubbing across the top layer of the skin creates the blister, which is all pressure related. Okay. Yep. Um, at some point, that never, it, it, the skin covered over, but it's still pink underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, looks more like a, a, a varicose vein issue. Is that 
something you've seen as well? Well, generally we see a lot of scar tissue on the feet, and that just may be her way of forming scar tissue. But we can usually identify all the patients that come to clinic that have spina bifida get a foot check at every visit. So we take off shoes, socks, similar to what you would do for a diabetic. We also test with a monofilament to find their areas of sensation so that we can document those. Um, but we'll often find he evidence of healed ulcers that look similar to that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. My daughter had a heel breakdown probably when she was about 12 years old. She's now 25 and still dealing with the same heel breakdown. It heals, it breaks down, it heals, it breaks down. Mm -hmm. We did eventually go to a uh, wound care specialist who specialized in diabetes, and he yep. managed to heal it with electric stim in a matter okay. of a, a month. But unfortunately, she doesn't check every day. Right. So what can you, once it heals, is there anything you can do to strengthen the skin? Not that I've anything? found uh, on the market. I've seen people use the hydrocolloids, and that would be a product might be familiar to you, would be like Duoderm. You know, I've seen people try to use those as a preventative measure, but they just get so gummy and sticky and stick to the skin that I haven't found good luck. Um, sometimes if we use a product like Aquaphor, which is an emollient, so you're putting an emollient over that bony prominence so it has more slide to it so that it's not taking the shear forces onto the skin. Actually, the emollient is taking those shear forces and kind of um, breaking, almost like you're breaking the surface tension in water. You know, you're trying to break that shear that's happening in that heel. But it can be very difficult, and I get that question all the time. Can't we just come up with something that will strengthen the heel, you know, once it's healed? And unfortunately, every time it opens, it loses about 20% of its strength. So you can imagine that over time, you know, you've opened it to the point where you hardly have any skin strength left. You know, and it can be very troubling. So in some of those cases, I have seen some, not that they're okay, but some rather dramatic um, bone removing techniques that have gone along there too to try to remove bony um, fragments, you know, that are causing repetitive openings. Uh, and take them out completely so that it's not occurring anymore. Hard to do on a heel, but similar. Other questions? Mm. It's just a comment. I work in a seating clinic, and we find that a lot of people will get a specific uh, pressure cushion, but then they'll put a chuck or some other kind of uh, towel or something in between, right. just so people know that that also um, affects their skin integrity. Sure. And that's why I try to tout, you know, the only thing between you and your seat is usually your butt. And of course your clothes, because we can't get away from that. But we should also choose clothes that allow for better movement too. I have a couple of um, late teens uh, with spina bifida who <clears throat> were male. Um, like to wear jeans, and jeans are great, they're very fashionable, but based on their body anatomy, it was hard for them to keep their jeans up, they kept falling down, so their solution to that was to buy a smaller waisted jean, so that the pressure of having smaller waisted jeans would keep them up. Unfortunately, they ended up with pressure ulcers here, uh, from the jean band resting there all day long and creating pressure on that thigh crevice where it bends. Um, causing significant stage three, and at one point we could see kind of all the way down into the inguinal, you know, canal, so very significant. But it seemed like a good idea at the time to that person, you know, I'll just buy the clothes a little bit tighter. Um, but if you can't feel that, you know, by the end of the day, if I'm wearing a tight skirt, I can't wait to get home and just release that pressure. If you're not feeling that, you could go days, you know, and cut off all that blood supply. Same with beds, too. We can get the thing, making sure that if you're sleeping on a bed, you're not sleeping like the princess and the pea on many, many layers. It's just the mattress sheet, maybe one incont pad, and that's it, to minimize pressure. Another question? Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, this does not deal with the sores, but stretch mark. What can you use to I don't deal a lot in stretch marks. Um, I know moisturizing the skin has been somewhat people using, you know, vitamin E and some of those body butter creams, but um, I don't do a lot with stretch marks, so I wouldn't be able to answer that question. But thank you for asking. I have some. If you find the, the key, you could call me, and I'll try to put it into action. My son will crawl across the carpet and just the skin will rub right off the tops yep. of his feet. I'm assuming that's a level two. Yep. Um, 
I just put, like, the triple antibiotic ointment in a bandage. Is that? Yep, that's fine. It's a moist wound healing environment, so you're creating a moist environment. You're then providing protection, both the emollient that is and the Band-Aid, you know, from that. Some folks will go to more creative measures. You know, some folks wear knee pads. I know that's his feet. That some of our assistive technology folks are more creative in kind of sewing things up in the back room because they have that luxury neoprene, little neoprene sleeve that you can put on the base. So when they're crawling, they're not taking their skin with them. So, yeah, but that's excellent. I was wondering if they have the stage three where it's like an open gap. Why can't they just do the surgical glue or some sutures? Uh, most of the time it's months and months of healing. Right. Most of the time it's because of the exposure of um, bacteria into that setting. So if you go and seal that up, you're just going to brew infection underneath. Um, we just can't get it clean enough. So what we try to do is heal it from the base up so that you're getting new tissue at the base and it's coming gradually up. I have heard... Um, one mom did tell me that, you know, her son got a stage three in another state and they kind of cleaned it up and just sewed it down. But um, I haven't seen that in our state. Most of the time, uh, if we're doing any kind of surgical closure, it's after significant debridement of the area, cleaning it all out, making sure there's not a chance that there's any bugs hiding in there before we do it. It's just kind of like you just can't sew up a dirty spot. And no matter what, they're usually in areas that are already contaminated with um, E. coli, enterococcus, the, the poop bugs, because they end up in areas that get exposed to poop. So. I have a question about um, where um, the scar is from... Um, if you have somebody who's overweight mm -hmm. and, they're, um, and it's a deep you know, area, so there's mm -hmm. kind of a deep crevice, and then you have all these little bubble, you know, things in the skin. Yep. What do you do about the moisture there and when that starts getting irritated? Well, it depends. Those can be very tricky. Um, there are more products on the market. You know, there's a silver impregnated fabric called Interdry, which you can cut into strips and put into folds. Um, based on that, uh, you're able to wick moisture out of the fold, also kill any bacteria that's in the bottom of the fold because it's warm and dark and things like to grow there. Um, it's a little pricey. It's about, it was about $90 a roll last time I looked, and that came like a roll of tinfoil. It came like in a pouch like tinfoil does, um, but it's soft. And I haven't had any good experience uh, getting anybody to pay for it other than handing them the $100 or whatever. No insurance has wanted to cover it yet. So sometimes I'll have folks um, massage some uh, powder, like an antifungal or a drying powder, into that area, and then we'll use 4x4 four four gauze with each end wicking if we can hold it in the fold um, to allow moisture to escape. Some folks have thought about going to some of the sports stores and buying the fabric that you'd wear, like the interdry fabric for sweating, you know, perspiration, and cutting that into, you know, and using that. So... Sometimes you have to be really creative with skin folds. Um, and yeah, I would massage it. I wouldn't sprinkle it because when you sprinkle it, it just balls up into little balls. I'd massage it into the fold so that it's covering all the skin. I don't usually use antibiotic ointments. I try to avoid them just because of the overuse of antibiotics as a whole. Um, I try to just create as uh, dry a setting as possible since the skin is closed at that point. What about the lymphedema that a lot of the young people get? Um, I've got one young woman in my clinic, and um, she doesn't like to wear the, the stockings. You know, we, we tried to do the uh, prescription jokes for her, didn't like it, and she just keeps breaking down. Mm -hmm. She oozes, and then, you know, she just breaks down, and, and it's just... I've been dealing with this for over a year with her, and it's just it's trying to figure out a solution. I just don't know what to do. We're trying right. to do anything. Yeah, I'm really struggling with that myself. Um, in clinic, a lot of the days, just because of the significant, I mean, I'm seeing it in like 17, 18, 19-year-olds, uh, mostly gals, but some guys with spina bifida, where their legs have just become kind of tree trunkish, um, And just based on the fact that water's got to come out somewhere, it starts creating wounds. And so we've, too, been trying to look at 
more attractive styles of the jilt stockings, trying to get things that don't look so medical, you know. But in the end, um, we usually end up at least one time having them see vascular so we can rule out anything that's underlying that might be causing it. Because we're not seeing it in everybody with spina bifida, but we're seeing it in a lot of folks with spina bifida. And then, then trying to go to symptom management. So, yeah. Any other questions? Then I thank you for your, t oh, one more question. Okay. Is, have you had any particular luck with any type of mattress on a bed that prevents any pressure sores, or is there one that you recommend over another with kids? Yeah. Um, recently that came to our attention at Gillette as a whole because we were opening a new intensive care unit for kids, and when they came out to show us the beds that cost like $25,000 per bed, we thought, wow, that does everything. You don't really even need a nurse. You can just put them in the bed and it'll do everything for. Unfortunately, um, it didn't want to do anything if the patient weighed less than 70 pounds. Uh, and the reps didn't really want to talk about that, the fact that it didn't do anything if you weighed less than 70 pounds. So we undertook a study um, that was kind of thrown together very quickly, and we pressure mapped every mattress that came into our uh, product demo. Um, we weighted a CPR dummy to the weight of a smaller kid and put him in the bed and did all these things. Um, we found a really good mattress out of Winona, Minnesota, which was right in our own backyard called Comfortex. Um, I'm not selling Comfortex, but it, it mapped the best out of anything and was around $500. I mean, that's cheap when you're talking the beds they were trying to sell for 25000 This was just for the mattress. So Comfortex out of Winona is a foam-based product. Um, and the problem that you get into when you get into air is, A, air is louder. So some folks will complain that it takes them out of REM sleep. They'll be waking frequently as they move. Um, uh, B, it doesn't support smaller weights, which we will often see with some of our spina bifida younger kids uh, and our CP kids. And then um, C, uh, in the home settings, at least in Minnesota, nobody pays for air uh, unless you have a significant ulcer. It has to be like a large stage three or four ulcer on your trunk or pelvis. Um, and as soon as it's healed, they take it away. So as soon as your skin is healed, they take away the mattress that helped you heal your skin. Um, based on the insurance guidelines. So that's one I would recommend. Um, the other thing was looking in your local area to see if you have, we've got a company that goes into homes and pressure maps as well. So if you did some trials, they come out with their pressure mapping equipment that's mattress size, help you pick things based on um, maybe your child's individual characteristics. The toughest thing I've seen has been those um, kyphotic areas in the lower back that protrude. Those kids generally will sleep on their stomachs. When they come, the mom will say, or the dad will say, sleeps on the stomach, never been an issue. The issue comes, now we want to do a Mitrofenoff or an ACE procedure. They can't sleep on their stomach post-op. Their back has never had exposure to any kind of pressure because they've worked so hard to protect it. And that really becomes a complicated situation. So that would be the two cents I could give you. They have online resources at Comfort Text too, if you want to look at that. Um, I just had a question about the circulation boots. Um, have you had much success in using those after a pressure sore or treatment? Um, I haven't. I, I really don't have any experience. I have one doctor that attempted to get some home coverage for lymphedema of some uh, pumping system boots and really did not have good luck doing that. Um, in the home setting, so I, I can't really shed light on whether that's beneficial. There's a lot of stuff out there that they're working on, you know, um, including the chambers where people can go in and get more oxygen and the uh, uh, mist therapies and the, those kind of things. We um, pretty exclusively just do pressure, so we haven't gotten into a lot of the more um, technical state-of-the-art therapies that are out there uh, until they show more of an evidence-based practice and then they might be willing to adopt them into the clinic setting. Hi. Hi, my name is Amanda Soti. Um, I just had a question. Do you know what kind of a chair cushion that you recommend for us in wheelchairs? I have a gel cushion, so okay. I don't know if, is there a cushion that can like relieve pressure or? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cushions on the market that are pressure relieving. Um, 
my cheater statement will be that um, it's really individual to your body shape. Um, the way if you have any kind of scoliosis, if your pelvis tilts one way or the other, you really need to work with someone who's trained in helping somebody pick a good cushion um, versus having just an off-the-shelf one-size-fits-all. Um, and then making sure whatever cushion they find that's good and, and pressure relieving for you, you know what the maintenance is. A lot of people love Rojo cushions because they're all those little air fingers coming up and people think they're great, but they need weekly maintenance. And without weekly maintenance to make sure that they're properly inflated, we've had ulcers from overinflation and people that are sitting on the boards from underinflation when they come in. Um, gel needs to be kneaded, you know, throughout the surface to disperse it so that when you sit in it, it's across all surfaces. So just making sure that once you work with somebody that's really trained uh, on how to find the best cushion for you, looking at your factors, sharing any past history of skin breakdown you've had, trouble that you've had, then say, now what do I need to do to maintain this? You can give me a schedule, you know? Every week I need to do these three things to make sure this cushion does the best. And then like they were talking about from the adult session before, making sure someone's laying eyes on that at least once a year to make sure that it hasn't uh, had any problems, any foam breakdown, any of those things that would cause you to have a pressure ulcer from an old cushion. So everything needs replacement. Even the best cushion is still going to decline as the years go on, especially when you're sitting in it 14 to 16 hours a day. And before when you said something about the IT bones, what mm -hmm. exactly, what is that? Your IT bones are your mm -hmm. sitting bones. So if you feel right here, it's the bone that's coming right down through your butt cheek. Those are your IT bones. We call those the sitting bones. Oh. And they're also called ischial tuberosities if you got really fancy about it. I like to call them sitting bones. But I try not to throw in all that jargon in there so everybody's all confused. So any other questions? One more from the back there. Just from a preventative standpoint, um, the use of a, of a recumbent bike and the IT wounds, um, what do you recommend for prevention as far as wounds that could occur in the IT area as a result of using the recumbent bike? I think um, we're uh, blessed at Gillette that you could bring that IT or that you could bring your IT in with you. That would be important. Uh, you could also bring your bike in, and we could work with our assistive technology to look at pressure management on that. But I think it's something we need to be talking with the vendors and the bike people about too, recognizing that if they sell us equipment that's supposed to increase our function, they also need to be paying attention to the fact that if we're spending a lot of time in that equipment, how is it going to offload our skin? So sometimes um, our folks in ATD have built some custom cushions for folks to sit on, especially if they're going to spend a lot of time. If you're not going to spend a lot of time, it would be kind of that 30 to 60 minute rule, making sure that every time you're on that bike, when you get off, you're checking your skin for any areas of redness, um, potential issues that would trigger you to make adjustments in that seat. So we can't pad everything, so that's where those daily skin checks come in, that that could trigger us like, aha, I need to, I need to do something about that setting. So thank you for your participation. Feel free to give me a contact by email or after the conference. Thank you for attending this session. Because meeting your needs is important to us, we need your feedback on this presentation. Please take a few moments to complete our evaluation which can be located by clicking on the Clicking Here hyperlink on your screen. It will only take a few clicks of your mouse to provide us information to make the SBU experience better for you and others. If you have any questions relating to SBU, please contact us at sbu at sbaa.org.